Well, the rumor, I don't know how it started, but the rumor is that Monero would only give you 16 bytes of arbitrary data. And accordingly, you couldn't fit, you know, swap to Bitcoin as a note in that because it's only 16 bytes. I have the entire B-movie script saying otherwise. Thank you very much. Um, and to that end, right, they were saying like, hey, we need to fit this arbitrary data. And we said it with Neurotopia. No, you can just do that. We don't have limits on that. We should. We don't. <laughs> and yeah, we're just both going to be using that. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. CakeWallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Duman continues his convo with Luke Parker in part two of Developing Sarai Dex and Why Monero. Monero Talk starts now. Let's go back. Let's jump back to Sarai. So sure. what, what um, you know, so, so similar to ThorChain, mm -hmm. what what are the, you know, economic incentives that drive the system? Why, why are people running nodes? Why are people putting money in liquidity pools? Uh, what are the, what's the incentive model there? So the main form of incentive is in the value added, which is going to be via the trading experience. And accordingly, it's going to be the trading fees. Uh, we discussed a few different models for calculating fees. There's everything from uh, flat fees on the transactions to fixed fees on trades to uh, percentage-based trades. So larger trades get a higher percent taken. And you can actually do the inverse of that because there's an interesting property. If someone swaps, you know, uh, 100 Bitcoin in, it, we're using liquidity pools, kind of like Uniswap, because then you're not dealing with a whole order book. You're just saying, oh, yeah. You, you want Monero and Bitcoin? Here's the current price. Just go at it. And that is really helpful when we have, it takes 20 minutes to confirm a Monero transaction. So if you say, I want to buy this order, it might not exist in 20 minutes. You kind of want the liquidity pool here. But if we have 100 Bitcoin and 100 Monero in the pool, because Monero has been doing great recently, thank you very much. Um, if you then go to add 100 Bitcoin, well, suddenly you're doubling the pool. And you're going to cause a very different price imbalance because you're just flooding money at this pool. So accordingly, there's not only are you going to suffer slippage, but you have the opportunity to charge a fee saying, hey, you're causing all this slippage. We're going to charge you a higher tax. But the idea is when someone causes such a significant imbalance, someone else will come and correct it. Someone else will say, huh, my Monero is currently worth four Bitcoin because of this price imbalance. Um, you know, I think I'll take the Bitcoin. <laughs> and when they go and trade it back, we also charge fees on the arbitrage. So because we charge fees on, on the arbitrage, they're kind of giving us two trades. And because they're giving us two trades, you can argue that they should get a discount more. <laughs> like there's a lot of really interesting fee models that you can prescribe to this. And we're still evaluating how to do it. But primarily what we're looking at is trading fees to go to the liquidity or whoever provides liquidity and then there's also a block award who will go to those who operate the multi-sig and we're also discussing um incentive programs where part of the block award be, uh goes to the liquidity pools and that might be under the DAO. DAO if we do a DAO, still a lot going on with the discussions primarily trading fees there is a block award interesting interesting mm -hmm. um so real quick if i can just note um Pools are against the native coin of the network Sarai. Mm -hmm. So instead of having half the Monero in the Bitcoin Monero, 20% against USDC, and then 30% against Ether, uh, we just have it all against Sarai. Not only does it help create an efficient routing, it also lets us determine the price of assets in Sarai, which opens up a few interesting things like the fact that we can say, you know, we have 100 Monero that's worth 
100 Sarai, again, random numbers, absolutely not making a representation of anything about Sarai. But I I mean, I said one Bitcoin was one Monero earlier. But if we're saying it's worth 100 Sarai, then the bond numbers, it would have to be, okay, so in order to be secure, we need a bond that can secure 100 Sarai worth of Monero. And accordingly, right, we need to know what the price is. So it makes sense to have all the pools against Sarai, not only for efficiency, yet also so we can know the price of assets and be able to ensure the network is secured accordingly. And I just want to distinguish that because in my example, I said Bitcoin Monero, and I want to be clear. Technically, it would be Bitcoin and Sarai and then immediately transferred to Sarai Monero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, th and this is why you're using a native coin. It allows you to, to, to benefit from, the, from these things. Not only does it help with the efficient routing, but it goes back to the bond security problem where if we have bond in Bitcoin, then we either A, need a centralized group to hold it and be the arbitrators of the bond, or B, we could put it in the multisig and then whoever steals the multisig just steals the bond back and there's not actually a cost there. How how does one become a liquidity pool provider? Uh, so we're actually planning on integrating with Cake Wallet at this time. Uh, if any other wallets are interested, you know, let me know. There's no exclusivity here. I'm willing to uh, talk a bit. <laughs> awesome. But it means that if you have Cake Wallet or Monero.com, you'll be able to switch over to Sarai, and it will, uh, I, yeah, it will just let you say, hey, do you want to add liquidity? And there are still discussions there. Uh, Cake Wallet hasn't started their integration yet. I've still been working on the Sarai side of things. I'm not trying to make any representations on their side about how it will pan out, just commenting what they've commented. <laughs> but ideally, yeah, via CakeWallet or Monero.com, it'll just say, hey, do you want to add liquidity and be part of the trading experience? And there are conditions to that. As I said, the pools are Monero and Sarai, which means that if you want to add Monero to the pool, you can't just add Monero. You also have to add a matching amount of Sarai which means if you have 100 Monero you want to provide in liquidity, what you would do is trade it for 50 Monero and however much you write. And then you would add that to the pool. And accordingly, you can say, oh, but now I also hold the Rai and I just want to hold Monero. And then this wouldn't be for you. And I think we have to make it explicitly clear, you know, this is the process that will happen because truly, I don't want to misrepresent anything here. There's caveats, but... If you are cool with that and you're like, hell yeah, I'll get in on this, right? It sounds cool. Decentralized exchange. You just open your app. You say you want to add liquidity. And it's like, great. We'll take your Monero. <laughs> right. And then, uh, obviously you're, you're getting, you're essentially getting interest now. You're getting the, the fees, the, the trade mm -hmm. fees. Um, it, exciting, man. Very exciting <laughs> stuff. So I'm just... Is there, is there, do you know the tokenomics or that that hasn't been figured out yet? So we don't have the exact tokenomics. I've had some initial proposals, not with hard numbers, but kind of around the different mechanics we'd want in place. And then uh, I have a friend who is far more versed in economics than I am, who also offered to submit their proposal for how they think it should work. And we have a few differing ideas. So we're actually going to have a couple of proposals on economic distribution and growth. But it'll be interesting to see. And it's hoping I'm, something I'm hoping to get more locked down over the next week or two. How do you see the tokenomics differing from Thor? Is there like some obvious things that will be different? Uh, I think the main question is going to be our initial distribution. Uh, so with the chain, there was an ICO and then there was private sales. And then there were also the team managed treasuries. And that enabled them, one, to distribute to the community so the community could have access. Two, it enabled them to get partners who could provide liquidity without issue. And three, it gave them a war chest that they could use to fund development and give out to people to use for liquidity or they could exchange other coins as needed. With Sarai, we're not discussing an ICO. We're not discussing, you know, seed allocations to partners. Um, that's not an untrue statement. What we are discussing, and I want to be clear about this because truly I want to be fully transparent. Um, we have to form an initial multisig. We can't get funds in the network if there's no funds. We can't 
get new nodes if there's no font. So like someone has to take this initial first step. So we are looking at, I believe 11 is our current target number. Um, 11 people from developers to, uh, we are discussing partners to community members who are trusted to form this initial multi-sig, which won't be economically secured, but community members, you know, the people who built this. <laughs> and with that, we're not discussing issuing a full node's worth of bond because we did the math on that. And that is a very, very large number. <laughs> But we are discussing a partial amount because they're going to be running a node for the next year and they're going to be helping bootstrap the network and they're going to be starting things off and enabling Sorority to become what it is. So technically, yes, you can say we are discussing an initial allocation to partners, but we're not discussing just giving 5% in an unlocked wallet. No, we're discussing it being in a node and bonded and accordingly locked up and used for the betterment of the network. Um, but what really is the question is, how do we get Sarai into the hands of the people? How do we get them to be able to get Sarai at liquidity? And my proposal on the matter was a bit chaotic, and it was actually, we just airdrop it. We open deposits for like two weeks. Anyone can add whatever they want, and they can withdraw at any time. And then at the end of two weeks, we just add a bunch of Sarai to the pools. And you can still withdraw your Bitcoin, Monero, Ether, whatever. But if you do, you only get the Monero half back. You don't get the Sarai we airdrop. The Sarai we airdrop is time locked. So you can't get the Sarai immediately withdraw and sell. You can still withdraw. We won't stop you. It's just the Sarai is time locked and probably would be distributed, you know, over time to not create any large cliffs. And that would immediately create trading pools with decent volume and allow people to start exchanging coins, start earning trading fees because it's time locked. People will be able to see the trading fee experience. Other people will be able to buy in and add their own liquidity. There's a lot of considerations there. Uh, the alternative proposal, which is something I actually haven't reviewed yet, uh, thinks that is extremely chaotic <laughs> and I can't blame them. The reason I like it is just because it's decentralized, open, preserves a lot of options. Uh, but the alternative proposal, I believe, is on a more, instead of airdropping a large amount of coins, I believe it is doing a distribution schedule, which I have yet to look into. Mm. So so there's a few options being discussed. It's still an active development. Uh, we actually have a channel on our Discord and on our Matrix space to discuss it. And uh, it's, are, you're getting good feedback on, on that initial, the, the initial proposal you were talking about? Or is, is that the, you know, the airdropping approach? So... I've talked it over with a few people. It's not something that's been formalized yet, mm -hmm. but from what I, from the feedback I've gotten, it would work. The question isn't, does it not work? Is it not decentralized? The question is, what are the parameters? Would we give it? And then with this alternate proposal, the question will be, is there something better? And there might be something better. There might be something that we can better model, better create expectations around and therefore be more reliable. But it's also expected to have some trade-offs, such as potentially having some level of initial distribution. And we will have to evaluate them. And I am planning to kind of further discuss it in community channels after we have a reasonable draft. Mm -hmm. But it's, there's still a lot in the drafting stage. Um, I personally consider myself a developer, so I can comment on Rust all day. I can comment on how we actually got full Monero transactions in Rust. We no longer use any of the original Monero code for that, which I'm very proud of. But economics is something I'm happy to give my opinions on decentralization on and leave to people more knowledgeable to do the implementation. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fun to watch in real time. This come together. Mm -hmm. So is it like, is it going to be capped? Do we know that? Is that, is that uh, uh, the supply cap? Yeah. I think we're probably going to mirror Monero onto a tail mission. <laughs> really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that for reasons of the architecture of the system or is just so economic? the multi sig holders always have to earn some reward for holding these funds, running a node, running up Bitcoin nodes so they can actually do Bitcoin transactions. And they could get some share of the trading fees. Yet trading fees are intended to increase the value of Sarai. So if we're then minting a very small percentage of Sarai as tail emission, it's effectively giving the nodes a share of the trading fees because when nodes go to 
take those rewards and convert it to other currencies for usage at bank their servers for profit for whatever right it will lower the value as any tail emission does but the expectation is that the growth surpasses it which is what we have to design a model which properly does that and does not hyperinflate mm -hmm. but now it's proven that tail emission works we haven't had hash power plummet we haven't gone to zero uh not yet at least and we're hoping to do something similar with Sarai. Very cool. And it'd be proof of work mined? Uh, we're not really discussing mining. So okay. it technically is a proof of stake chain because we have these validators who are putting up a bond for the nodes and they also produce blocks just because it makes sense. So because they're earning the block awards, right. And that's partially why we're also discussing part of the block award going to liquidity providers. If we just gave it to the initial nodes or nodes in general, the issue is, is that nodes are just the initial nodes originally, and then we have 11 people getting all the Sarai, and that's not sustainable and not how we decentralize the ecosystem. So there's actually a concept, uh, which I'm aware of thanks to ThorChain, and this is what they call it, and we'll probably use the same terminology on this issue, called an incentive pendulum. It says if there's not enough bond, rewards go to the bond side of things to make it more profitable to get more people in bond. And if there's not enough liquidity, you know, if we can have bonds securing $1 million, but we have $10 in assets, really not a good first day, I take it. Um, we swing the rewards the other way to get people to actually add in liquidity and participate in the system. It's actually a pretty clever design. I'll give them that. And we're considering something similar. So what we want to encourage is when this airdrop happens, people get their eye, become bond uh, bonded, achieve a sustainable system like that and then eventually rewards will swing back the other way and encourage liquidity uh, this reward will decrease it will become fractional but as we gain liquidity we'll also gain trading fees and we'll also be able to justify this growth very cool very cool so the block reward uh would go go to those running the nodes uh, and the liquidity providers potentially it's and <laughs> also uh, some other fund for development potentially or no Potentially, that one is something we're still discussing, and it kind of can be considered independent. I'm not trying to say it doesn't have to be modeled in the economic system. I'm saying that we can do a lot of the security modeling just off the bipartisan system and then just say, oh, yeah, we want a DAO that has this amount of funding. Okay, we can throw it in on top. What does the name mean, man? <laughs> I've actually gotten asked that a couple of times. Uh, Sarai is short for caravan, uh, caravansarai, which is another word for caravansary. So it's where it's kind of like a courtyard outside of hotels where traders would rest. And in these courtyards, trade would naturally occur. So I really liked the name when I first heard it because it sounded, I want to say modern. The truth is, I'll be a weeb and say Japanese. <laughs> and I do appreciate that kind of hypermon and aesthetic, but I also acknowledge it's kind of sickening. It's kind of sickening to see all these neon branded projects who always just want to claim to be the next hypermodern evolution. So when I found out it actually had a historic meaning dating back to the original Silk Road, um, I appreciated its history. I appreciated its honesty about what we're doing. And I felt. You know, you don't hear this and think dusty old decrepit. No, it does sound modern when you first hear it. Awesome. But it also it's like sounds... the, the little marketplaces along mm -hmm. the Silk Road, etc. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool, man. Very, very appropriate. I like it. I like it. You, you really thought this all through. I got to say. You're... <laughs> the name, actually, I can't take credit for that one. That was uh, Justin Ehrenhofer. Oh, SGP. wow. Mm -hmm. Way to go, Justin. Um. Yeah, but so what what drove you to do this project? I guess, like you said, it was because of the the issues you saw with 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 Thor, and what was mm -hmm. like the real motivating factor. So, I did atomic swaps when um, the atomic swap paper came out, just because I believed it was critical. Uh, before that paper, I was actually planning to do um, I was actually planning to implement some form of scripting into my project just to ensure that we could do atomic swaps because I believed decentralized exchange was critical. I believe cryptocurrency needs to be verifiable and trustless. And that's what atomic swaps were. So I always had an appreciation for decentralized exchanges and atomic swaps. It's 
something I've wanted to do for, a, I think, a couple of years now. How old is Monero Atomic Swaps? Monero Atomic a year? In terms of, like, actually, no, it has to be more than a year because I'm pretty sure it's like 18 months. I don't know. Twenty twenty. It, it, it's surprisingly it's long. Change the time scale on things. <laughs> um, so I've always appreciated it, and then I feel that another project kind of reaching the point they were moving into testing, and it's been a very labored process for them. And I understand why. It took me, I think, three months to get my Monero library working as I needed it to. I think the Monero library is going to be about. 20 30 percent of the project's development effort <laughs> um, but um when that moved into testing i kind of realized hi if i want to do this if i want to be able to provide a service i think is superior and kind of lay it down before another project takes up stake this is the time to do it and that was what really motivated me too awesome man how many people are working on this right now is it basically just just you cone it up or you got other contributors? So, so far it's mainly been me. Uh, I actually have had a couple of other people contribute. As I noted, I have a friend of mine working on the economic side of things. Uh, obviously, Cake has is planning to do an integration and I've been discussing a bit of that with them. I have developer friends I can reach out to. And then I actually am hiring um, in a couple of talks there. And I actually had a uh, Newt. Elizabethium. I'm not sure which name you know them by. <laughs> um, Elizabethium, I know. Yep. Right. During the uh, Ethereum and Aerotonic swaps, I actually they actually contributed a bit of work as well, which I'm very thankful for, working on the uh, Ethereum integration side of things. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was really great. I don't know if you mentioned this in passing already, but what is it being built? Like, what is it being built from? Are you developing this from scratch or is it a fork of some other so blockchain i tried to do a blockchain from scratch <laughs> i really liked it it had a lot of great features um i decided i did not want to spend three years doing this i'd like to spend six to twelve months to kind of get up and running yeah, yeah. We, we'd appreciate that too. <laughs> um, so it's actually being built on substrate um you, you've heard of cosmos i assume right cosmos i've heard of Right. So there's not just okay, okay. Atom, which is the coin of Cosmos network, but Cosmos itself is kind of a blockchain framework where you can define individual, you can just define a blockchain, but instead of worrying about peer-to-peer, -peer, instead of working about database, instead of working about, you know, consensus, you just say, hi, I would like a transaction that does this feature. I'm willing to code this feature. I just need you to give me the blockchain. And Cosmos is like, great, you got a blockchain. And Substrate is similar. Substrate is where Cosmos is in Go, Substrate is in Rust. And Substrate's like, great, you want a blockchain? Okay, here you go. What features do you want? We can give you a bunch of features already, or you can program your own. And there's pros to it. There's cons to it. It gives you a lot more flexibility than Cosmos. It expects you to do a lot more than Cosmos. But it's providing the peer-to-peer -peer side of things. It's providing the database. It's providing the blockchain. Uh, we're working on our own consensus for a few different reasons, which was probably one of the things that will exceed the time we have here today. <laughs> but we're working on that, and then we're also adding in the actual, you know, DEX and token functionality to ensure we can handle Monero and handle trading pools. Awesome. When you, when you say your own consent, you mean your own proof of work or your own? What do you mean by your so own? So it is still going to be proof of stake, and um, as I said earlier. Stake, right? Um, Substrate has a few options. One is known as Aura. One is known as Babe plus Grandpa. Like they do provide you with options, but we had two issues here. The first issue we had is I'm not sure their docs are up to date on this matter because I was confused when I last looked into it. But basically, they prefer to confirm their preference is grandpa and grandpa will give you finalization it will say this block is finalized nothing is going to change that and that's great it's actually a property that's appreciated you know we like knowing that data is final and transactions are confirmed the issue with grandpa is that it finalizes in groups instead of saying here's a block it's now finalized it will say here's five blocks and oh yeah i guess the fifth one finalized so now they're all finalized 
and that offers higher performance. You know, you're not finalizing as often, but it creates this weird state where you're kind of counting confirmations, but you're also kind of just waiting for finalization whenever that happens. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to move token transactions into consensus. If we get Monero coming into Sarai, we don't want to have all 100 nodes say in a transaction, oh, we have Monero coming in, because then we're just giving 100 transactions on chain, all saying the exact same thing for no reason. So when we're discussing proof of stake consensus, we're already all signing off, we approve on a block. If we're already all signing off, we approve on a block. Can't we just have one transaction saying that Monero came in and use the exact same signatures we were already using? Why do we have to add 100 transactions for no reason? And be inefficient. And Substrate gives you flexibility there. Awesome. It requires you to code it, but it gives you flexibility. But the other thing is, because it's part of consensus, um, if you want to run a Sarai node, not because you want to be a validator, just because you want to send Sarai kind of like you would send Monero, and you want to run your own node because you want to run your own node. If you did deal with uh, unconfirmed blocks, blocks that I'd yet to finalize, a malicious validator could say, oh, by the way, I received 100 Bitcoin. Please give me money for it. So we kind of need all the nodes to finalize the block in order for nodes which aren't also running Bitcoin, aren't also running Ethereum, aren't also running Monero, but just running the Sarai side of things. In order for those to be secure, they do have to wait for finalization in order to achieve the efficiency we want. So we're trying to drastically optimize things, you know, 100 signatures to or 100 transactions to just one transaction. That's great. But it requires a bit of legwork. Awesome. And um, so, has Substrate been used for other projects, like well-known projects? Uh, the biggest one would be Polkadot. Oh, OK. okay. Right, which is um, a former Ethereum Foundation, Gaffin Wood, I believe. Uh, they did Polkadot. And then that has been also used for Kuzama which I may be mispronouncing, which is a, I don't want to say a wow narrow to Polkadot because it's not meme-based, but it is meant to be a more experimental version of it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a few other projects which are building on top of it. Uh, Moonbeam is one. They're doing kind of like the EVM, but over substrate because they're saying we'll be more efficient than, you know, standard Ethereum forks yet. It's still Ethereum, so... It's easy for people. They can use it. They can be familiar with it. They can get existing apps. So there are a few projects using it, and it's shown to be reliable, and it's incredibly flexible. Cosmos gives you consensus. Unfortunately, it doesn't let you update it, and that makes it simple, but it makes it rigid. What we want to do is we want to create something efficient, something sensible, and Polkadot, besides being in Rust, which is just my preferred language, uh, or Substrate, besides being in Rust, Substrate just gave us the flexibility while still giving us all the parts we wanted. Awesome, man. And uh, you kind of said this in passing as well already, <laughs> the fact that you, you know, a big part of this is multi-sig, right? Mm -hmm. So did you, or is my understanding that you already kind of built out the Monero multi-sig implementation in Rust? Is that? <laughs> it's actually something I'm really proud of. Um, and it was actually my talk at MoneroCon um, was about multi-sig and Monero. And that was more of a theoretical piece. Has it been posted yet? I don't think it's it's on YouTube yet, right? I think they posted YouTube videos of the talks, but, but they only did videos from the outside day. Yeah, and I was yeah, on the yeah, inside yeah. day. The inside, yeah. And I didn't see it uh, when you were inside. So I posted my slides on my GitHub, and then they ended up posting slides on their, I believe, also a GitHub. I don't believe recording my talk was made available. I don't know if they have any footage. I don't know if they only they, have... They probably just didn't put it up yet, I hope. Okay. Well, they might... I think for some people, they had footage of the people, but not the slides. So uh -huh. slide-heavy presentations didn't carry well. And mine was slide-heavy. <laughs> I, I wanted the slides to be... You could download them after and still kind of go through it and, like, learn about it. It was meant to allow people to get a glimpse of the math. And then if they actually wanted to learn the math, be able to go back. So, right, I commented on multisig at MoneroCon and I gave the talk on it. And... There, Monero actually has a custom multi-sig algorithm, but it's not solely custom because it's Monero and everything we do is kind of custom. We just have a multi-sig method. I'm not sure other people have discussed, 
Uh, I think the Monero Research Lab paper is kind of the paper on this type of multisig. I'm not sure there was prior work on this specific construction. And it's very interesting. It is also secure, which I will give credit to it for. It also gives you a threshold multisigs, where a threshold is, you know, you only need 10 people out of 15 to do a signature. You don't need all 15. But it also has its own inefficiencies. And it still has value. It's just when you start discussing getting up to 100 people in your multisig, it starts to become infeasible. So there's this more modern protocol known as uh, Frost. And Frost is actually what Sarai is planning to use. And it will let us get up to 100 nodes in a multisig and just be vastly more efficient there. So we, uh, I wrote an implementation of that in Rust. And I'm actually very proud of it. I spent a lot of time optimizing it. I think my initial efforts were, I think, like three seconds for 50 uh, to do a signature. And I'm pretty sure it's now 0 0.7 seconds for 500. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time optimizing it and really just making it the best it could be. And then, yeah, I, as part of writing the Monero uh, wallet in Rust, I wrote Monero Multisig in Rust. Amazing, man. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a Monero phenom. <laughs> um, so are, are there other things that need to happen with regards to multi-sig in Monero before, before it's ready for something like Sarai, or you're saying that's, that's, that's essentially so, been solved. Right. So there's kind of two discussions here. We, not only is Monero's offering inefficient at a protocol level, it actually is, it, to be clear, it's perfectly usable for its intended use case. Right now it's intended use case is it Sarai right now it's intended use case is backups for one or two for say you have like a company or a charity and you want a three out of five multi-sig. Monero's multi-sig is perfectly infeasible for that. And I don't mean to call it bad. I don't mean to say, oh, by the way, go to my work. No, that's not what I'm here to say. I'm trying to say Sarai has a different use case than what Monero expects. So it made sense for Sarai to do its own implementation, not only so we can ensure it's tailored for what we want, but also Oh, yeah. Also, because at the time, Monero's multi-sig was, uh, it had vulnerabilities, which is something I also talked talk, uh, touched on at MoneroCon. And the new hard fork is expected to fix those. We're labeling it experimental because while we did get an audit of the code, there's still some discussion regarding the protocol getting more formal review instead of just the code side of things. So we're labeling it experimental, but it fixes all known issues. And I personally believe it's secure. But when we were discussing Sarai at the time, it didn't have all the fixes ready. And it was still in the PR process because this was months ago. And I'm like, at the very least, if we want to do something with multisig, as of today, we would have to fork the Monero repository and manually merge in their fixes for multisig, potentially adding commits on top. And we would already have to do work here. So it'd rather, it just makes more sense to build the more efficient protocol you know, make sure that we're tackling security on our end. And now we'll have to pay for our own audits. And that kind of sucks. <laughs> but also it guarantees Sarai gets what it needs. And it guarantees we're not yelling at Monero to hurry up because we just need some feature. <laughs> it's amazing that you went, you went on and pretty much solved that on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had a lot of help from Co when discussing it. They helped with a a lot of aspects from the design and really helped me understand the existing Monero multi-sig and some of the complexities. You know, it's even if I'm the one who's done most of the commits, there's always a group of friends who I can point to who have helped me along the way. You must have had a good time at Monerotopia, right? I mean, not not, not the oh, whole Monerotopia, but I, I, like the, the you know all the guys, all the people were there hanging out, talking in person. All the Monero conferences have been great. Yeah, you must have <laughs> good progress there. That's awesome. Um. One of the things actually that came up at Monerotopia, the Thorchain guy mm -hmm. uh, brought up uh, something with, you know, uh, a reason why it'd be very difficult to implement Monero, something with its 16 byte memo size or something. But wait, I don't know how that rumor started. Okay, wait, wait explain. This. Go ahead. <laughs> so, right, as you said, like there was something about a 16 byte memo. So, uh, Thorchain and Sarai for this matter, uh, we use arbitrary data on the chains we connect to. So like Ethereum, Ethereum is built around data. You can do a lot of things with data. Bitcoin has something called OP return, which lets you specify 80 bytes of whatever you want. 
And then Monero has something called TX Extra, which lets you specify arbitrary data. Uh, fun fact, there is the entire Zero to Monero PDF, which details Monero's cryptography, available on the Monero blockchain across eight transactions. And there's also the entire B-movie script in one transaction. I was actually sent the hash for the latter earlier today when I brought it up on Matrix. Um, so there's also right. a bunch of email addresses in the payment ID field. I think there's also credit card numbers <laughs> from when we did you know, a event back in the day. We let people register with just their email through payment ID. <laughs> oh my god! So you're responsible for this, uh, right? So great party. It, it's a very long discussion. There have been calls to remove it. I actually restarted or. It, there, it hadn't been talked about in months, and about six days ago, I left a new comment. So it's being discussed again. It's gotten a bit heated. <laughs> People have very a variety of opinions. But basically, what we do is we projects use that. Uh, in this case, Thorchain and Sarai, we specify a. We basically say, "Hey, we want Bitcoin. We're sending it to this address. A uh, Bitcoin address takes 40, 50 characters in text." And then we have to say an amount, you know, we want at least 1.1 Bitcoin out. And we have to say it's Bitcoin. And the letters BTC take three letters. So let's say it takes roughly 60 characters just to say, hi, I want Bitcoin sent to this address. Well, the rumor, I don't know how it started, but the rumor is that Monero would only give you 16 bytes of arbitrary data. And accordingly, you couldn't fit, you know, swap to Bitcoin as a note in that because it's only 16 bytes. I have the entire B-movie script saying otherwise. Thank you very much. Um, and to that end, right, they were saying like, hey, we need to fit this arbitrary data. And we said it with Neurotopia. No, you can just do that. We don't have limits on that. We should. We don't. <laughs> and yeah, we're just both going to be using that. Are they going to be limiting it? And isn't there also a concern with privacy that you'd want them all to be the you know, right same so, set? You want to have the same size amount, so there's no. Mm -hmm. So that's the one advocacy is for privacy, and then the other comments is that you should not be allowed to upload the entire. And I just keep coming back to it because of how ridiculous it is. The entire B movie script onto the Monero blockchain. You should be. You should have some level of limit here. And I believe the discussion for limits is my proposal was 255 bytes. If you have 255 bytes as a limit, uh, in just one byte, you can specify how long it is. You can say it's either zero bytes or a full 255 bytes. If we allow 256 bytes, which would kind of be the round number to developers, then we couldn't specify zero or 256 without using two bytes to represent its length. It's just an annoyance very minor nitpick that I wanted to optimize for. Um, but 255 bytes, it's enough to encode two Jamtis addresses and a short message along with it, like 30 characters. So maybe like an email. So you could say, hi, here's my address. I'm looking for the owner of this address. I don't know. There's really stupid contrived scenarios you can make here. But basically I said two Jamtis addresses and like 30 characters on top. That should be reasonable as a limit. And that was my recommendation. The issue is that it decreases privacy because now if there's a transaction with TX Extra and that transaction says, oh, this is a Sarai trade, it has the TX Extra for Sarai, great. Now, if anyone selects it as a decoy and a ring signature, which goes back to our original discussions, people are like, well, that's a Sarai trade. This transaction can't be this decoy because this transaction isn't from Sarai. We know it's not from Sarai. So now if we only had 11 decoys, now you only have 10. And that goes back to the statistical comment and why we're increasing the ring size and working on further increasing it. So that's the reason to have zero, not to mention the belief that Monero shouldn't have arbitrary data. Monero is meant to be a currency and a private currency at that. Why are we hosting large files? Um, and I kind of made some antagonistic comments I basically said, oh, yeah, you can remove TX Extra. You, you can. Um, I'm still going to put arbitrary data on the chain. You can't stop me. And Tevador, who advocated for removing TX Extra, proved my point. Um, in Monero, we have stealth addresses, and you specify the uh, a single public key that the funds end up going to. And whoever knows that public key can spend the funds, and it's 
whole stealth address thing. Public keys are 32 bytes, and you can set 30 of those bytes to whatever you want. And then there's a one out of however many chance, I believe 65,000, that you can randomly set the rest of the bits and find some combination that's valid as a public key. So you get 30 free bytes, and then you'll most likely be able to set the rest of it to it being valid at some point. And because of that, you can kind of just throw in 30 bytes where you shouldn't. And you shouldn't, but you can. <laughs> and because of that, it's called a Stegana... Oh, I'm very bad at pronouncing things. Steganography. There we go. Steganography. <laughs> it's, it is, I think, widely popularized in pop culture by the whole Cicada 3301 thing, where the initial challenge, it had an image that they encoded text to. Mm. But that's the original idea. So you have some image. It could be an image of this very podcast. And you open it up with a certain program. And then it just says, hi. You're just able to encode a message. Mm -hmm. And it's the same idea here. We're having these random messages, but now they're public keys. Now they're what shouldn't be messages. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, no, you can remove TX Extra. I need this feature. And I have a way to get this feature. So <laughs> like, do we want to remove TX Extra? Or <laughs> because there are considerations here. If we if I'm now adding outputs just to store data in ways that I arguably shouldn't, I'll give you that. Monero now has to check that these outputs are valid um, because I'm only using 30 bytes, but technically the point is 32 bytes. It's less efficient, so I'm using more storage space. And you get the privacy, but it's taking more space up and it's more computationally expensive. And as we move to 64 and 128 large rings, is it really an issue if one of them has this? And these are the discussions we're having, and we actually brought it up on Matrix or IRC, if you prefer, but earlier we were discussing, do we prefer having extra and transactions which identify as different, or would we prefer to take the computational hit and have transactions which are pure identical and don't reveal that they're, um, and don't reveal that they have messages, but also we're going to have to spend a bit more processing power. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was, it's a very interesting discussion and it's, I, I know, I know Co is the <laughs> strong advocate of deprecating them. Right. Uh, I, would, I would think, um, yeah, misspeaking. I just know he doesn't like the I, idea of, you know, the, so the, as the, part the, of Seraphis as a communication tool. T, so t, the original crypto note developers made one of the worst decisions possible and they actually used TX extra as part of the protocol. So it's TX Extra is an arbitrary data field, but if I send you a Monero transaction, it goes through stealth addresses, of course. And as part of it going through stealth addresses, um, I have to generate this random key. And that's the stealth part. You know, if I, if I didn't generate anything random, it would always be to your same key. And that's not very stealthy. So I generate some bit of random data and I now have to tell you that random data so you can decrypt the output and verify it's yours, so on and so on. And I do that via TX Extra. So it's actually used by wallets and all wallets are expected to be able to handle it in a consistent way in order to send and receive funds. It is the most frustrating thing. It's so bad. And then like Minergate decided to throw random data in there and they never explained it. And they just like used incompatible for, oh my gosh. So basically we had TX Extra and it was used as part of the protocol despite being arbitrary data. And that was just a horrible decision. So Seraphis removes that. No, we have data that's part of the protocol. It's part of the protocol now. You just get it, and we're not dealing with that bullshit again. But also, we still technically have this arbitrary data field. So the question is, do we just not use that as part of the protocol? Do we remove it entirely? Mm. And I don't want to comment on Ko's opinion. I'd have to double check it. I know that they were against uh, the steganography approach, because if I'm adding extra outputs to hide messages... Anyone who's scanning the blockchain is now like, oh, are those outputs to me? And they have to spend the effort on that. So not only does the Monero network have to verify those outputs, but wallets have to scan them. And there are annoyances to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in, in terms of Sarai, you're saying mm -hmm. you're, you're not reliant, reliant upon Monero having the... TX. So we are using TX Extra because it's there now and it's not being removed tomorrow. Uh, if it was removed, we have workarounds. 
those workarounds may not make me the most liked person in the community. Mm-hmm. And then in an absolute, no, we don't want to have messages on Monero. Um, there is kind of one final alternative we've discussed. Um, you can have the messages be on Sarai in the first place, mm-hmm. which I'll fully say is the least antagonistic to Monero. Uh, but one, I don't believe this is notably antagonistic to Monero. I believe it's a feature offered by Monero, which greatly helps out. And two, there's a lot of issues if you have the memo beyond Sarai, notably with a chicken and egg. You want to do a swap to exchange Monero to Sarai. So you send in Monero. Great. Now you need to sell Sarai. You send in Monero. Okay. There's a fee for that. So we don't get spammed. Okay. So you need to pay a fee in Sarai to tell us you send in Monero to get your first Sarai. Chicken and egg. And then there's also a few security concerns, a few, you know, practical considerations. And it's just always kind of ends up is the practical answer, the simple answer, the effective answer is to have Monero handle the data because that way it's tied to a specific transaction. There's a guarantee we have the data available. There's a guarantee that this data is for this transaction. There's a guarantee someone else isn't trying to replace the data. And there's a guarantee that the data will be accessible for as long as the Monero transaction is. So there's a lot of reasons that this is legitimately beneficial. Uh, Sarai is planning to use it. If it's discussed in the future, we have workarounds. And if we truly needed to, yes, we could work out our own solution. It would just have a user experience and potentially security considerations. Awesome. Why, why do you think Thor never added Monero? What, what do you think was the, the reason there? I mean, I think they're trying to. <laughs> Are they still working? Because the, there's the Haven integration. Yeah, that's the integration that's still going on. Okay, so it hasn't been abandoned. They're, they're still it's still going. Okay. It's been going for, you, you might know more than me how long it's been going on for. Um, it's yeah, still going. I yeah. actually talked with them. Uh, they yeah. didn't handle the uh, burning bug, which is also something I talked about at Monericon. And then because of the very specific conditions created by Thorchain and by Sarai, there's actually a new variant of the burning bug, which I believe I was the first person to comment on. Um, And I kind of said, like, even if you fix the burning bug, there's the second issue that you also have to fix. And I made a proposal to kind of fix not only the burning bug, but also this different variant of it kind of at the root. And... It's being done in Seraphis, but Seraphis is still a while out. So now I'm trying to look into doing a implementation of it here today in Ring CT land. Because it isn't actually a protocol hard fork. We just need wallets to update. So that means we would get wallets to support it as an option. And then Thorchain and Sarai would both use this new feature that would prevent not only the burning bug, but also the extrapolated burning bug, which is the new one I wrote up on. So yeah, they're still working on that. Still trying to get Haven listed. If they do ever list Haven, the comment is that they'll move it to Monero. We'll see if they do. You're saying if Thorchain ever lists Haven, then that will be one. Right. Right. Presumably, once they list Haven, they'll move on to Monero. So when is Sarai launching, man? You're, you're gonna be you're gonna beat you're gonna beat Thorchain and getting Monero up and running on a... definitely hopeful there. Um I really don't want to make deadlines because I mean, I, I tried to make deadlines with my last yeah, project. Yeah, I, 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 no, 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 you don't have to answer that question. Well, can you give it a rough? What's what I'm hoping for, and this has been my answer in the past, is to have local network setups within the next month or so. And that's just for my local network. I said, me, me alone. You're, you're not welcome here yet, Doug. Um, <laughs> but once we have local network setups, we can kind of say, yeah, we can get funds in. Yes, the node runs. Yes, the node is able to talk to other nodes. And we can say, this makes sense to let us move forward and build a proper network. So once we have the local setup and we can do larger testing, we can actually verify we can get funds in. That's when we would start doing, uh, I think the label we're using is ProtoNet. So it's not a testnet because we don't want, we don't want end users coming in just yet. What we're looking for is to say, here's a prototype. Uh, if you want to start working on developing against it, if you're interested in a wallet, if you kind of want to see exactly how the Monero transactions look. We will run a node. It will run against the Monero network and you're welcome to send data to it. And if you want to start building integrations, here's your first opportunity to do so. We're going to change things. Users should not touch it, but it is a network and we're able to run it and so are you. 
And then after we do prototypes and iterations there, we'll be moving to test that. And I'd hope that we're at test that by end of year at the very latest. Exciting. Awesome, man. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, what will it look like, you know, in it's, it's most ultimate form for the end user. It's running on cake wallet. Uh, is it going to be like, you know, just like you'd use an instant exchange for, for the end mm -hmm. user? Is it going to feel like that essentially? With stronger guarantees, with more liquidity available, with more transparency on exactly how it operates. You have Monero. You're like, huh, I want Bitcoin. Swap the Bitcoin. You enter the amount. It says the amount you'll get out. You just hit send and come back 30 minutes later and you have your Bitcoin. Awesome. All right, buddy. I think we, we covered a lot. I think we covered a lot. I, I loved it. I know people are going to love it. Uh, we'll probably put this out maybe in, in two two episodes since we, we went long here. Where can people learn more about you, follow the projects you're working on, specifically Sarai, obviously? Give, give us a... Uh, love to grow the community a bit. Currently, we're organizing on Discord and Matrix. I've already gone in a bit of flack of that. Uh, for supporting Discord, but Discord isn't really less private than a public matrix room. They're public servers. Anyone can join and read the messages. If you don't want to sign up for a Discord account, sign up on Matrix. They're bridged. So we have both Discord and Matrix available. I think I sent you the links. So hopefully those will be in the description. I, yeah, we'll put them in. I jumped in those rooms today that, you know, I was checking those out. Uh, Sounds good. That's great. Yeah. Then we also just had the uh, Sarai Dex Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then my personal Twitter is just Kaya Nerf. Awesome, man. Um, yeah, no. Should we say? I guess we, we won't. Should we say yet? Did, I don't know. Did, did Vic announce that you might be doing something soon? Did Can we say this? I don't know. Uh, in New York? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You put it yeah, out? no, that, that was we did. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so I'll, I'll see you in New York. Looking forward to yeah, that. Yeah, I'm very excited for it. It's been a trip I was planning to do with a friend for a while. And while I was there, Vic's just like, what if we just do a meetup? And I'm like, sounds like fun. That's that's going to be epic. And you'll I guess you'll present, right? Yeah. I'm very excited for it. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. All right, man. So I'll see you in like a week. See you in like two weeks. Seems great. <laughs> <laughs> see you soon. Right. Greatly appreciate it, man. Greatly right. appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.